Hi everybody, welcome back to AP Environmental Science. This is um, Unit 2, uh, Topic 2.4. Uh, this is on ecological tolerance and niche. So again, kind of furthering our discussion here on biodiversity. Uh, we're going to start today with um, a little picture here of some polar bears, you know, living you know, up in the Arctic, you know, obviously the water is probably pretty close, pretty, pretty cold, you know, probably just above freezing. We've got some snow cover in the background. <clears throat> I mean, obviously, excuse me, you know, this, this isn't a desert landscape. You know, these are specific living conditions that polar bears seem to like and seem to thrive in. And that kind of, um, I guess kind of explains what this term ecological tolerance is. It says every species has an optimal environment in which it performs particularly well. You know, and polar bears perform particularly well under a certain range of conditions. I mean, if the temperature was 95 degrees, uh, polar bears probably wouldn't do as well, right? So this is probably one of the reasons why they're struggling a little bit with global warming. I'm not saying it's getting up to 95 degrees where they live, but it's getting much warmer and the ice is melting and their environment is changing. So um, that means that they have to sort of adapt to those conditions. And if they can't, uh, then they're going to struggle. Uh, this curve here uh, is kind of showing us what ecological tolerance you know, kind of means. Um, you know, if you look at this on the, on the X axis down here, you know, we've got temperature and on the Y axis, uh, we have what we call performance. So let's just kind of you know, pick some temperature ranges here. Let's say we have zero degrees here and maybe over here on this side, we've got maybe a hundred degrees. You know, let's say this is your Fahrenheit temperatures right in the middle, obviously we would have like 50 degrees, right? And I don't know, let's say this is 40 here. I'm, I'm drawing with my fingertips, sorry. Let's say this is 60 here. Let's say over here, maybe this is like 90 degrees. Maybe over here, this is like 10 degrees or something. Whatever, I'm just making up some numbers here. This, is, this isn't perfect, but anyway. Um, if you look at this graph, uh, there's, there's a couple different colors that we see. Um, and the, 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 and the, the kind of the orange color here, is showing us something called the fundamental niche. So let's say we have a species of, I don't know, say they're fish or something, or they could be birds or whatever we're, we're talking about. You know, the fundamental niche is, in, in this case, since it's referring to temperature, now on the x-axis, I mean, it, this doesn't have to be temp. It could be any abiotic thing. It could be like water pH. It could be um, soil pH. You know, it could be... Um, gosh, a whole bunch of things, you know, optimal, like sunlight, you know, amounts of sunlight, whatever. It, it can be anything abiotic. In this case, temperature, it's a pretty common one. So what this is telling us is from this range, you know, this range in orange here, let's say 40 degrees to 60 degrees, that's kind of the, you know, the, the, the perfect temperature range for this particular organism, you know, whether it be a fish or a bird or whatever it is. You know, we call that the fundamental niche. It's, again, kind of the ideal range of, of abiotic conditions. So, you know, in, in this particular case, as long as the temperature remains between 40 and 60, you know, these organisms can survive. They can grow like plants, for example, and they can reproduce. So this is kind of ideal for that particular species. Now, when you get outside of that range, let's say you get into these yellow areas, you know, things become a little bit less ideal, right? Maybe it's a little bit too warm over here, a little bit too cold. You know, we actually call this the Goldilocks curve, you know, like the porridge, you know, from the Goldie, if you ever heard the story of Goldilocks and the three bears, right? You know, my porridge is too hot, my porridge is too cold, mine's just right. Well, this is like just right in the middle. When you get outside, it starts to become a little bit too warm or a little bit too cold. That's not really ideal for whatever this particular organism is. So when you get out here, the organisms can survive, maybe grow, but they don't really reproduce as well. So same thing over here if it gets too hot. Then you get a little bit further away, and now we're getting into a range where they really can just barely hold on, barely survive, 
know, they can't grow, they can't reproduce. So we're, we're getting further and further away from that fundamental niche, all right? And their performance just starts to go down. They don't, they don't perform as well, all right? So the range of tolerance, I think that's a pretty good definition to understand, and also the term fundamental niche. So, I mean, this, this organism, whatever this is, a fish or a bird, you know, it, it, it can operate, you know, from let's say this temperature right here might be about five degrees all the way up to about 100 degrees or so. But anything outside of that, it can't really it can't really survive. So the tolerance range is anywhere in this curve. Anywhere in it is the range of tolerance. But the fundamental niche is this area in the middle. OK, so make sure we understand that. This kind of showed us the same thing. Right. You know. Here's that fundamental niche, you know, kind of that, that big curve right in the middle. You know, that's kind of the optimal range. And then when you get outside of that, organisms start to become stressed. When you get outside of that, you know, we get into that, we call it the zone of intolerance where you know, very few organisms can survive, if any. All right, so again, this kind of relates to the same thing we just talked about here. A couple more terms here called realized niche. It says, Species don't always live within their fundamental niche. You know, they don't necessarily always live under those ideal conditions. So we have something called realized niche. Realized means that, you know, it's just kind of the range of conditions that they actually live in. You know, like, for example, polar bears, you know, even though polar bears may function best in a certain range of temperatures, that doesn't mean that they're currently living in those ranges of temperatures. I mean, right now, polar bears are probably living outside of their fundamental niche with, with global warming happening. So they're, they're living in their realized niche or living you know, in a certain set of conditions, but that doesn't mean that they have to be perfect. A um, couple terms here. One's called a niche generalist. Um, a really good example of this is, this is this little insect on the upper right. This is called a meadow spittle bug probably never heard of these before, but maybe you have. Um, meadow spittle bugs can live pretty much anywhere. You know, they live in a variety of different habitats. They can feed on a variety of different things. So, you know, their, their range of tolerance is actually pretty broad. I mean, they can live in a lot of different types of living conditions. Temperatures can be uh, you know, they can vary from, they can live in warm, they can live in cold. So they have kind of a, a, a large range of tolerance. Whereas a specialist, like this little guy on the bottom here, he's called a skeletonizing leaf beetle. Um, he's a little bit more picky about where he lives and what type of habitat he lives in. Um, you know, he feeds on very specific types of insects. You know, he doesn't have a you know, this big wide range of diet like the guy on the top does here. Um, so he's more of what we call a specialist. The thing about specialists is because they're so picky about their living conditions and their, their, their niche, that they're a lot more prone to extinction, you know, than let's say, for example, a generalist is. I mean, if there's something that happens in a habitat, I know in the previous video we talked about fragmentation, Right? So if anything occurs to like disrupt the habitat, then these specialists might be a little bit more um, impacted by that than let's say a generalist would be. All right, So make sure we kind of understand the difference between a generalist and a specialist. You know, here's some pictures here of some different organisms. You know, for example, a panda bear. You know, panda bears are really only found in one area of the world, right? They live in China. They're very specific about what they eat. You know, they eat bamboo. So these would definitely be kind of a specialist species. Koala bears, right? They live you know, mainly in one area of the world, down in Australia. You know, they eat eucalyptus plants, which are very specific species of plant. So again, this would be kind of a specialist species as well. You know, think about deer, think about raccoons, right? We find these things pretty much all over the country. Right? I mean, they eat a variety of different things. They reproduce fairly quickly. They have a high tolerance for temperatures. So these would be more of a generalist species uh, compared to a specialist. Um, another really good example of uh, generalist and specialist, this is called the cane toad. Uh, the cane toad is uh, what we call an invasive species. 
Uh, it was actually introduced to Australia back in, the, I want to say, the 1960s, I believe. Uh, they brought these toads in because they are generalists. I mean, they will eat a lot of things, especially insects. Um, and, you know, the idea was let's introduce them to Australia and they'll take care of their mosquito problems and all their insect problems. And you know, these cane toads will just devour all these insects, right? They're kind of a generalist species. Um, some of the problems that they found with cane toads was that, yeah, they, they did what they were supposed to do. You know, they, they kind of ate, you know, everything in sight, you know, all the different insects that were, you know, pests of farmers and things like that. But one of the problems was um, they didn't have any natural predators themselves. So, like, they brought these cane toads in, and the cane, toad, the cane toads had, like, ideal living conditions, right? I mean, they, they had all the food that they wanted. They had no natural predators, one, because they're poisonous. Nothing wants to eat the cane toad. Uh, the, the, yeah, cane toad. And then these cane toads, the, the population just went insane. So you got to be kind of careful sometimes with a generalist species. You know, when you bring them into a new area, if, if they have optimum living conditions, they're just going to reproduce like crazy. And now they have this huge cane toad population, like in the Caribbean and in Australia, um, all because they re they introduce them to other regions that normally they don't live. Um, but you know, normally, in, like in South America, like where they normally live, they have predators. But when you take them to another area where they don't have any predators, then they like just go crazy you know, population wise. So, cane toads kind of an interesting species. You should probably uh, Google them or YouTube them. You'll probably find some interesting things about. Them about those guys. Uh, another term here is called a keystone species. Now a keystone species is one where um, it's extremely important to the community. You know, let's say you have a pond, for example, with multiple organisms living there. You know, chances are there's gonna be at least one, maybe more than one, keystone species. Where, for example, if you removed that species, the entire community will crumble, okay? A really good example of this is sea stars. You know, sea stars, um, you know, they, they, they kind of live along the coast, uh, intertidal zones, you know, where they, or mainly where they live, um, but they feed on crustaceans. Uh, you know, they'll feed on, or I should say mollusks, not crustaceans. They'll feed on things like uh, mussels, uh, clams, things like that, that like stick to the rocks, and they keep their populations in check. Um, so imagine if something happened to these sea stars, then all of these populations of these mollusks would skyrocket, and that probably wouldn't be good uh, for the environment. It's, it's kind of the same thing, you know, when you have, let's say, coyotes you know, that, that hunt and kill deer. You know, if the coyotes weren't there, you know, the deer populations would go through the roof, right? So these sea stars are kind of a keystone. If, if you remove them, then the rest of the ecosystem can get out of control. That wouldn't be good for the whole ecosystem. Here's another example of a, of a keystone. It's kind of a, an interesting one. It's called mycorrhizae fungus. It's, a, it's an actual fungal species. And over here on the left is a good picture of the actual fungus. It's like this fuzzy stuff that's growing all, all over this soil. Um, but that fungus is actually very, very important to a lot of plant species. What the fungus does is it will grow um, under the soil, you know, near the roots of the plant, and it'll, it'll actually help the plant absorb nutrients from the soil. So you can see over here on the right, right here we have the same species of plant. The one on the right was grown with mycorrhizae in the soil. The one on the left was grown without it. So you can see how much better the plants do with the mycorrhizae fungus compared to without it. So if that fungus is present in the community, then all the plant life is gonna be thriving. And that means the animal life will be thriving as well. But if you remove the fungus, if it's not there, then the plant life struggles and then the animal life you know, can't find food and the whole community just you know, takes a tumble. So the mycorrhizae fungi is a really good example of a uh, keystone species. Uh, finally here, here's an interesting one, it's, it's, it's a beaver. You know, beavers are keystone species, and, and the reason why they are is because they construct habitats for other organisms. 
I mean, what, what a great role that they play, right? I mean, uh, another name for, for a, a, a B or another, another role that they take on is something called an ecosystem engineer, which means that they, again, maintain and create habitats for other organisms. So here, for example, is a beaver dam right in the middle of a river or a lake or wherever this is. And not only does the beaver kind of go in there, and that's where they'll have their babies and take care of their young and all that type of stuff. But, you know, this is also a nesting area for birds. Um, it can also be, you know, what you don't like underwater. There's, there's a whole bunch of wood just piled up under the water. And this also is like a habitat for juvenile fish, you know, where fish can come and lay their eggs and things like that. So the beaver actually constructs this habitat, not only for itself, but other organisms can use it as well. So if those beavers weren't there building those things, then this whole ecosystem might struggle, right? So they're, again, a keystone species, but they're also what we call an ecosystem engineer. All right, guys. Uh, oh, one more thing. Sorry, I had one more thing to talk about. It's called an indicator species. Um, an indicator species is, it, they do exactly what they say they do. You know, they, they indicate whether or not the environment is healthy. Um, so if you have an abundance of these types of species, that usually means that the habitat is doing very well. I know one we've talked about before is frogs, you know, just amphibians in general, you know, that, that depend on a healthy air and healthy water. You know, if you've got a healthy, you know, nice diversity of, of amphibians, frogs, salamanders, whatever, you know, living in an area like let's say a pond or something. And that usually tells you that that habitat is pretty healthy, at least when it comes to water quality and, and, and air quality. If all of a sudden something happens and all the frogs are dying for whatever reasons, it probably means that there's something in the water or maybe in the air um, that's causing those organisms to die. Uh, spotted owls. Spotted owls are kind of an apex predator. They're, they're kind of a higher order uh, food chain predator in uh, forest ecosystems, especially what we call old growth forests. These are forests that have been around for thousands of years, never been touched by people. All of a sudden, you know, if something happens in those old growth forests, let's say, for example, they're being removed for timber or whatever, um, that's going to impact the spotted owls. And if those spotted owl populations start to decline, then it usually means that the habitat is not very healthy. Um, earthworms. You know, earthworms live in the soil. You know, they um, typically are good indicators that um, the soil ecosystem is healthy. You know, if you've got a lot of earthworms, you know, they're thriving, they're doing well. That usually means that there's no soil pollution, that the soil is healthy and that, and that it's fertile. So, again, these are things that can indicate to us whether or not a um, habitat is healthy. All right, guys, that's it for me today. That's topic 2.4. Again, rewatch this if you need to. Uh, fill in the note packets, and I will see you soon.